Hello, and welcome to MDIC's Annual Public Forum. During today's session, we will discuss how to apply MDIC's newly released framework on real-world evidence generation for in vitro diagnostics and an update on MDIC's COVID-19 real-world evidence project. Please make sure to join in the conversation on Twitter by following at MDIC Annual Forum and using the hashtag MDICAPF2020. Now, please welcome session moderator Danelle Miller, Vice President, Global Regulatory Policy and Intelligence at Roche Diagnostics. Welcome to everyone. As many of you know, on August 24th of this year, the Medical Device Innovation Consortium released a white paper, Real World Clinical Evidence Generation, Advanced Regulatory Science and Patient Access for IVDs. This important document provides a foundation, a much awaited regulatory framework for use of real world evidence in IVD decision making. Today, we have an excellent panel assembled to explore application of this RWE framework with in vitro diagnostics. Joining me today are Sue Dahlquist, Senior Director, Global Strategic Regulatory and Clinical Affairs for Thermo Fisher Scientific. Sue also is leading a working group exploring use of real world evidence to take EUA IVDs to clearance or approval status. So I'm really interested to hear what Sue has to talk about today. We also have Ed Hireman, PhD, Senior Product Cybersecurity Architect for Abbott. Ed is our resident expert on all things SHIELD and he'll talk to you a little bit about what that is. Wendy Rubenstein, MD, PhD. She's Director of Personalized Medicine for FDA, CDRH, at the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health. Wendy has been instrumental in getting out the IVD real world evidence framework and a great partner um, from FDA. And we also have Neelay Shah, PhD, Chair of Division of Healthcare Policy and Research for Mayo Clinic. And I am so interested to hear about what Mayo is doing in this space. But before we get started, let me do a very brief overview of the IVD framework. The real world evidence, clinical evidence generation, advancing regulatory science and patient access for IVDs. What is this? It's a framework and what the framework does, it identifies the current real world data and real world evidence landscape potential applications of real world evidence in support of IVD pre-market regulatory decision making, potential applications of real world data in support of IVD post-market issues. It's a proposed approach to evaluate relevance and reliability of real world data to assess data quality for IVD regulatory decisions, recognizing that not all evidence that sits in a patient health record will be available for real world evidence. It also includes study designs and methods to generate valid scientific evidence for IVD regulatory assessment. This recognizes, again, that not all RWE is going to reach the valid scientific evidence standard required by the FDA, but when it does, it can be an invaluable tool for FDA and for industry. The beauty of real world data and real world evidence is that it can be used throughout the total product life cycle for IVDs in the pre-market for analytical and clinical evaluation for approval and clearance where it's, it meets the relevant valid scientific evidence standard for compliance as in following on, on quality systems for post-market surveillance. And then it goes all the way through the life cycle again to give us input into further design changes for IVDs. So this is an invaluable new framework. Um, we can't wait to test it. Um, and that's a little bit about what Sue is going to be talking with us about today. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Sue Dahlquist to talk about the COVID EUA Real World Evidence Project. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so our project is really uh, focusing on what the excellent work that the real world evidence uh, group has, has come up with and utilizing that framework and, and putting it to practical use. 
So the project goal uh, for us is really to look at the healthcare networks that are well-developed and integrated data systems are able to generate real-world data accepted by the FDA for regulatory submissions. So what we wanna do is take the emergency use authorized tests that are out there now for COVID and determine how best we can use the real-world data to convert those to 510Ks. Next slide, please. So we're going to be um, utilizing the learnings of the SHIELD collaborative. And, and for those who, who aren't aware of SHIELD, it, it was a collaboration um, between FDA, CDC, NIH, CMS, IBD manufacturers, and others really coming together um, to look at the harmonization and interoperability for lab data. So making sure that we're describing tests the same way um, within institutions and between institutions so that we can actually use the data that's out there in our studies um, to be able to, to support the 510Ks. Next slide. So the way what, that we've decided to do this is we've, we've got um, two different groups and we're calling them boot camps. So we have the IVD boot camp um, that it consists of IVD manufacturers and we have FDA. And then we have the SHIELD bootcamp uh, that are folks from um, SHIELD as well as our healthcare systems. And we have some learnings and I'll explain on the next slide um, going into both of those groups. And then they'll come together sort of in what we're calling the classroom. And that's really where, you know, the rubber hits the road and we're gonna figure out, um, you know, the, the learnings from the IVD and what data elements we need, pair them up with the healthcare systems and determine how best we can go and mine that data from the, the healthcare um, systems that we've got. Next slide, please. So here, here's what each of the group are doing. So really, um, you know, part of our, our uh, group, we decided to split into um, the PCR and serology. So we have two subgroups for the IVDs. Um, you know, the tests are looking at uh, different in, uh, intended uses, so we wanted to make sure that we were capturing everything for both the PCR and for serology. Um, we're really learning um, and following the RWE framework in those. We are mapping to HHS data elements list to really determine, um, you know, once we have our intended use, uh, what data elements do we think that we need to capture out of those health systems to be able to support the 510K. Um, in the SHIELD boot camp, we've got, again, the, the folks um, from SHIELD really educating uh, healthcare systems and understanding the terminologies and in, in what we're um, calling these tests and how we're referring to them within our system so that we're able to mine the data um, that, we need, that we need to support the, the submissions. And then again, you know, we have in the classroom here, we have figured out, uh, it's really, you know, sort of a a gray area, I think, and, and there's going to be a lot of learnings in there, but the, the thought is to pair up individual companies who've got uh, an EUA for their um, test right now with a healthcare system that's utilizing their EUA and be able to match the two of them up and actually go out and, and really try to find the best ways um, to, to capture the data that we need. Uh, we have a lot of online resources that we plan on using. Um, and then the outcome of this, uh, next slide, please. And, and what we really want to do is share all of our information. So we've got, um, you know, not a very large, we probably have about 20 companies um, participating. Uh, I could be a little off there, but about 20 participating in the groups. And we're really trying to be nimble um, and, and uh, be able to gather the information relatively quickly. Um, we want to capture this learning, but we want to be able to share with a larger, a larger audience. So we want to be able to take the learnings that we have the, all the steps of the way and be able to share them on MDIC's um, website. We want to take videos so that we can, um, you know, you, the people who uh, are not able to participate can go back and, and look at all of the discussion that I think is going to be very important on how we uh, plan on obtaining uh, the data and that we'll be able to disseminate this to a very large group of people so that everybody can can utilize the same learnings that we have. And I think that was my last slide. Yep. Terrific. Well, I have a number of questions if that's okay. Uh, first of all, I think the first question that came to my mind as you were talking through what this group is doing, which sounds so interesting, is really how do you access this data? And so I want to first go to Ed Hireman. Ed, you know, what are the barriers to getting this IVD data to the electronic health record? 
And how do we dr address that? And I guess the second part would be, how can SHIELD help? Yeah, uh, thanks, Danelle. Uh, so uh, as you've highlighted, you know, there, there's certainly uh, you know, barriers and obstacles that, that need to be understood and addressed uh, to, to really make real world evidence and real world, world data and, and the framework itself work. Uh, because you know, it's, it's the data itself that, that is the core part of it. So really independent of, of the particular activity you might be uh, supporting, you know, whether it's as, as we're going to highlight here, you know, uh, uh, submissions, you know, pre-market submissions of, uh, of IVD tests for, uh, you know, uh, COVID IVD tests or other public health care initiatives. It really does all start with the data. And so what SHIELD has done is uh, really for the past uh, uh, five years or so, we've taken a look at what does it mean to make sure that data is complete, uh, the data is consistent, uh, and the data is accurate. And, and some things we've done in SHIELD then are around establishing vocabulary so that we have common ways to identify uh, the, the same thing. So whether it's the same test or the same type of specimen, uh, you know, the same type of test result, uh, you know, we're, you know, we, we spent a, a significant amount of time, you know, understanding, you know, what our vocabularies we can use and how can we provide that information so that as the test itself is being performed and that test is then going to be reported, that what is being reported for that test, you, know, you, you already have the necessary information that enables the, the upstream activities. And as I've mentioned, you know, it, it's, it's the data you know, that, that we're really focused on. And so you know, we've had opportunities to work with, for example, the IICC and the IICC that, that I am a, a member of you know, we, we put a foundation on how instruments communicate to a system such as the LIS. So it's very well known what information you know, uh, needs, to provide, needs to be provided and then how that information is transmitted, where it's transmitted in the messaging. And then the work with SHIELD has, has kind of looked at that and added even more uh, in collaboration with the industry as you know, on providing uh, you know, the, the information where in some cases the instrument doesn't have it or the instrument um, may be a legacy in instrument and can't be modified. So things such as our LIVID or LOINC to IVD catalog is a way to provide the additional content or mapping so that you can now take that information that in many cases an instrument was, has provided or in other cases that even, even a manual test that is being performed in a laboratory and you've got all of the necessary information to take that, to take what, what's been collected you know, at the point of origin, apply any additional mappings that might be necessary, either prior to or right, right within your LIS, so that then you've got, you've got that data in a consistent form. Uh, it's been you know, you know, normalized so that information from across laboratories uh, are consistent and can be, you know, and, and are using the same vocabulary. So now that is it, as that data travels and makes its way into a, a repository of, of real world data and real world evidence uh, you know, analysis is gonna be performed. You know that you can, you can compare, analyze, contrast you know, data that, that you've collected you know, across manufacturers, across laboratories. And so it, it's really, you know, SHIELD's focus has been you know, those obstacles of, you know, I've collected data and I just don't know how to compare it. I've, I've got different uh, you know, uh, descriptions, uh, you know, different ways to, you know, that have been used to transmit it. Well, SHIELD with, in, in combination with, all, you know, with the industry, we, we've really taken a look at what's it take to, to make that data available and usable for all of these real world, uh, you know, real world evidence initiatives. Excellent, thanks so much, Ed. Wendy, I wanna throw this next question to you. Um, Sue described what sounds like a wonderful partnership at MDIC looking at COVID-19 related IVDs. What role is FDA playing here and what is FDA looking for from this effort? Thank you very much, Danelle. Um, so, yeah, I, I wanna point out um, that FDA has been um, trying to uh, help leverage the use of real world data for many, many years now. Um, and this is uh, you know, one facet in that journey. 
Um, probably, I would say that FDA's role in real world uh, data, real world evidence is is better known uh, in the in the post market um, experience, but uh, there there is a footprint actually in the pre market experience, um, and. Uh, and another factor I also want to point out is that this this isn't something new in terms of the um, you know what constitutes valid scientific evidence. Um, you know the uh, uh, sponsors can come in with any number of types of information, and um, you know that can even include uh, you know things like case reports. Uh, but when it comes down to what is uh, can actually be utilized uh, for, let's say, turning an EUA into a 510K, uh, it does need to meet that same standard of uh, valid scientific evidence. Um, so um, I, think I might stop there uh, if you want to do a follow-up question. Um, yeah, you mentioned that uh, the footprint in pre-market is already there. Can you give us just an example of where you've used real-world evidence um, for an IVD decision? Yes, and so um, interestingly, when this question has come up before um, in a webinar uh, format, I wasn't so sure about what it is, uh, what's okay to talk about publicly and what it's not. So now I've gone in and done a, a little bit more homework. Um, so uh, so the, the summaries that are available, uh, the scientific summaries that are available, um, will often um, uh, provide some information about, uh, you know, a device that was used, that was uh, submitted, and what kind of evidence was used for it. I have, I've um, found that actually it's in a I think I counted up maybe three I can um, talk about. Uh, the real world evidence has been used in the context of um, uh, uh, clinical databases. And so, for example, one um, that is mentioned in the um, MDIC framework is, uh, is using detecting genetic changes associated with cystic fibrosis and so the, the marketing authorization of the Illumina MySeq uh, Diagnostic CF products, uh, they used RWE uh, to support the clinical validation um, part. And um, I think that's uh, tending to be a bit of a, a common theme. Um, and uh, similarly, the, uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center, the MSK Impact, uh, they also used for their NGS-based tumor profiling test, uh, real-world uh, data um, that, in, that uh, entered into the, into the evidences that were used. Um, and uh, interestingly, this has also been used in the context of an international biobank uh, that had data uh, involving newborn screening. Uh, so there was an IVD being developed for newborn screening, and um, uh, part of what was used is actually uh, leveraging medical records, which is of interest to this group here, um, to look at things like the invalid test rate, the, uh, the presumptive positive rate, the, uh, the normal rate. And so, um, you know, it's like a, I think about it like a feedback loop. Um, where there's a uh, you know alternate source of information about the test, and uh, you know in many ways uh, more relevant to the real world situation um, than a uh, kind of a finessed clinical trial. So those are some of them, um, and uh, I, I will say uh, CDRH intends to make this kind of information more available and is going through a, a process of uh, uh, collating it and vetting it. So I think over time, it'll be um, you know, clearer about what some of these examples are. Great, thank you very much, Wendy. Sue, I wanna go to you and learn a little bit more about this project that um, you're working on at MDIC with respect to these COVID-19 related tests. Um, first of all, um, a question was asked, um, how did you select the groups that are involved in this test or how did they self-select? 
Yeah, so I would have to say, um, you know, MDIC uh, reached out um, to to us um, to ask if, if we would want to participate and Carolyn may be able to speak um, better to how the, the groups were chosen. Um, as far as, as the team and, and where we are and how we split into our subgroups, um, you know, we realized early on when we were having the discussion, you know, the, the process that we're trying to follow here is really you know, we have our, our research questions or our intended uses, right? That's sort of where we're starting. And then we're understanding what data elements um, are necessary to inform the study. Um, so when we were having our, our initial discussions, and, and for those who aren't aware, we, we're at the very beginning of this. We've had, you know, probably maybe, you know, two or three meetings of the, the small subgroup. So we're still at the beginning phases where we're really coming to agreement on what our um, intended uses are and sort of the data elements that we feel we need to collect. Um, but, but we did decide early on that it made the most sense to, to split into the two and the team sort of self-selected. So we have, you know, um, we've got folks in the group who have PCR EUAs, we have folks who have serology, and then we have some people who don't have any EUAs, but just really wanted, wanted to participate in the group. Great, is, great. Go Danelle, ahead, Carolyn. This is Carolyn. I just wanted to share for the listeners. Um, the companies were selected, this is an MDIC project, and so any of our MDIC members are eligible to participate in our projects. So if there are listeners who would like to be engaged, I encourage you to reach out. Um, there is a contact on the web on the web page and we can get more information to you. Thank you. Terrific. Terrific. Good news. Thanks, Carolyn. You know, Sue, one more question um, back sure. to you is, you know, it seems like, as you said, the groups realized early on that you had different intended uses, some you know, detecting COVID-19 antibodies, et cetera, and different technologies. Um, how do you anticipate now that the protocols for um, collection and analysis of real world evidence will differ between the groups? Yeah, so I, I, I think one of them um, is sort of the, the source of, of truth. We've had some discussion around this one with the serology um, and with um, the PCR assays and looking at um, you know, perhaps asymptomatic and including asymptomatic in there. Um, and, and, you know, how do we go about getting um, sort of that comparison uh, data? Um, so not just the test that, that you're looking at and able to find that, but how are we ensuring that what, what we're having is actually the truth? So see some, some differences um, there. And it, I actually think the serology may move uh, along a little smoother, I think, than, than the PCR. One of the things that I think is in, important, um, you know, in talking about uh, being able to access the data, uh, one of the things I often think of is, you know, our EUAs are, are very specific and in, in to try to find um, health systems and labs that are using our workflows that's specifically called out in our EUA, um, I, I think may, Maybe challenging. Um, it'll be interesting to see because you, you know a lot of the labs do modify some of the EUAs and validate it for themselves. So I think um, when we actually go searching for the data, um, I, I do think that'll be uh, a, a challenge for us to do. But it will be very interesting to see um, if, if we're able to to find the amount of data that we need and the quality of the data um, on the specific EUAs themselves. That's a really good point. I'd like to toss this out to any of the three of you, um, which I know is dangerous uh, to just throw it up, but um, just consider it my serve. Um, as you look at, at this project, um, what hurdles do you think we need to clear to get to the point of clearance or approval? And this is probably as much a general question as it is specific to the project. Who wants to take the first stab at that? Okay, then Wendy, can you take a crack at it? Um, yes, because I was about to jump in anyway. Good. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just before coming to FDA, I, uh, I was at ASCO, uh, which has a, um, a, a real world data project called Cancer Link. And so uh, as, as part of that, I had the chance to uh, um, as I like to say, see how the sausage is made and, uh, you know, uh, bringing together information and trying to harmonize it from, uh, you know, 10 different electronic health record vendors and 50, 60 different sites um, gives you uh, 
you know, reason to, to, to pause. And I think that there, there are hurdles that have to do with um, really just a, a getting access to the, to the data, um, porting it over through pipes um, and harmonizing it because um, so little of the electronic health record data really uses any kind of codes and it's um, it's a bit sobering. Um, you know, you would think that there'd be the opportunity to, um, uh, you know, be able to pull one codes or SNOMED codes and they're actually pretty, you know, rare. They're far and few between. Um, the other thing is that when we're talking about um, the, the clinical presentation as a uh, kind of a, um, let's say a certainty about the clinical state, you know, we have, we have a PCR test, we have serology test, we have tincture of time, and then we have various clinical features that add up to um, certainty about whether the diagnosis is real or not. Um, those, those types of information are, um, you know, often have to be e extracted through curation. And if we're on a, a fast timeline, um, I worry about the, uh, the time as well as the cost of, of curation. So we'll, you know, perhaps end up, um, you know, starting this, taking what we get, having the lessons learned, such as there's a particular kind of data we can't get a hold of and how do we problem solve that. Um, I just think once we are getting into the weeds, um, you know, there are any number of issues and, um, uh, you know, the, the endless customization uh, that, that occurs within EHRs and probably to some extent with LIS systems is something that we're, we're it's a tough nut to crack. Great, thanks Wendy. I wanna to toss this one to Neelay who hasn't had a chance to weigh in yet. Neelay, I know that Mayo is doing a lot with real world evidence. You just heard Wendy talk a little bit about you know, some of the hurdles. What is Mayo doing, um, I guess, to overcome some of these hurdles and, and what are you doing in this space right now? Yeah, um, thanks. This, this is, I think, a, a key and important question in the real world evidence space. Um, we are involved in real world evidence for drugs, uh, medical devices, as well as increasingly in the uh, in vitro diagnostic space. And, and there's a lot of um, learnings when we think about the real world evidence. Uh, there's the study designs, right? So these could be observational using existing data or doing pragmatic uh, prospective studies. Um, and here in this context, I think to a great extent, we are focusing on uh, uh, observational, observational and existing data type studies. Um, and, um, you know, just going back uh, in that context, a lot of the focus historically has been on using um, administrative claims primarily in the drug space. Um, to, uh, you know, replicate uh, existing clinical trials to sh show the value of that type of existing data for real world evidence um, or conducting actually comparative studies, for example. But the challenge with the administrative claims data, um, it generally does not work for devices or uh, for uh, diagnostics, just because there isn't enough detail in those type of data to identify a specific uh, diagnostic or a specific device. And so more recently over the last few years, we've been lever leveraging our electronic health record data to better understand and um, uh, leverage uh, ways to um, you know, identified devices, for example, medical devices, specific devices working um, uh, as part of the NEST uh, under MDIC and working with a number of industry partners in that context as well. And, and that's been um, a really valuable experience to sort of understand what we can and sometimes can't do with electronic health records. So I think we have a lot of this data that sometimes uh, we haven't leveraged. They sometimes exist in different parts of the health system. So, um, so I think as, as Wendy alluded to sort of the customization of EHRs or um, different places where data may reside. For example, with um, devices, sometimes in, in a lot of health systems, the data about specific devices reside with supply chain and not as part of the electronic health record, but they're linkable. So you can identify what patients received what device. And similarly, if you're looking at diagnostics, 
It may uh, reside in the laboratory information systems or other types of electronic uh, data that, again, may not be linked uh, directly to the electronic health record. And so it's not been used in that context historically. I think that's where a lot of the opportunity is right now is to sort of, um, you know, understand uh, the existing data and sort of trying to understand, uh, generate evidence from the existing data. One of the challenges uh, that has come up in this context is when we are looking at more longitudinal outcomes. So I think when we look at short-term outcomes or, you know, based on sort of a single encounter or near-term outcomes, I think that uh, we can generally do pretty well with electronic health record data. I think when we start looking at outcomes that might be um, in three months, six months, one year, two years, uh, it becomes a little bit um, harder to use just electronic health records, primarily because patients oftentimes go to multiple different health systems. Um, they may move, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, all their data don't exist in um, electronic health records. And, and there's a couple of different approaches that we are sort of experimenting with to overcome that. One is, to what extent can we take the electronic health record data and link it with the administrative claims data? And, and that's one approach through which at least uh, sometimes patients may stay with the same health plan, so at least we can look at their outcomes over time. So take the depth of electronic health record from a single system and then follow patients out over time. Uh, and another uh, approach we are also testing now in, in multiple projects is sort of uh, allowing the patients to own their own data and then share it with us as um, investigators. And so there's a, there's a, uh, a few platforms that do that. And we, we've been working with one of the platforms where patients can actually go to every single health system where they get their care and be able to download their own electronic health record data. And a lot of, in some cases, also be able to download their um, uh, uh, claims data, uh, data from pharmacies, et cetera, and then be able to share it uh, in the context of research, but um, they know, you know, are, are doing it with consent. So that that's another approach. So I think that that's um, one of the other pieces we are trying to solve right now is trying to sort of understand long-term um, patient outcomes. I think that's where some of the challenges are with electronic health record uh, data, um, but with, um, you know, identifying uh, diagnostics, for example, uh, as well as devices, I think there's a num number of data sources that we have within health systems that are not always intimately tied to electronic health records that we haven't um, used to the extent uh, that they can be used uh, for real world evidence. Great. I, you know, when you talk about the long-term patient data, you know, the thing thought that comes to my mind is that's really the goal at the end of the rainbow, right? And so the question for me is always, how do you get there? Um, you mentioned, Nile, that there are things that you're realizing you can and can't do with EHRs. And I'm assuming, let's say, given today's current technology, that there are things you can and can't do. Um, what, what would fall in those buckets? Can you just give me some examples of things that you, you would put in the can bucket and you can't, and the can't bucket? Yeah, I think, um, I think the can bucket is really sort of the depth of data that exists in electronic health records that don't exist in other administrative claims or other existing data sources. And so these are things like being able to identify a specific device uh, that was used to perform a procedure or a specific device that was implanted in a patient or a specific manufacturer of a diagnostic um, that is available. So we know what is the specific um, uh, you know, diagnostic or therapeutic that the patient received that we can get from electronic health record data that really there aren't many other sources that we can get that information from. So I think that that's one of the key strengths. We also know, for example, um, although this is available in other contexts, but I think you can do it a little bit better from electronic health record is to actually know the results, you know, the vital statistics, uh, the, the vital signs or laboratory results that are available as sort of um, surrogate outcomes in some cases, which oftentimes are not available through other data sources as well. You know, those are a couple of areas where I think there's a lot of um, strengths uh, with the electronic health records. Um, the, the main limitation is, uh, as I alluded to, I think, um, 
being able to say if a, if a patient got a specific device uh, implanted or um, had a procedure done with a specific device and we wanted to look at outcomes in six months or 12 months, we don't always know just because we didn't observe a patient during that time frame, did they have a good outcome or did they have a poor outcome? How can we sort of better bring in the patient reported data or other um, ways to collect outcome data in a more rigorous way, I think will significantly enhance real world evidence uh, generation going forward. But that's, uh, that's an area where I think there's some limitations with, with electronic health records because when we don't observe a patient, we don't know is it because they're well and, and, and had good outcomes or maybe they didn't and went to a different health system and so their data don't show up in our electronic health records. So I think, I think that's, um, that, that's uh, unfortunately one of the key limitations at least we've observed uh, with the electronic health records is trying to get that sort of longitudinality and longitudinal outcomes for patients. Great, thank you so much for that. We have a couple of questions that have come in from um, some of the listeners, so I wanna share those. Um, Neelay, since one of them is about your topic, I wanna throw, uh, go ahead to that question and then I'll, I'll go to the earlier question as well. Um, this one I'll, I'll give to anyone who wants to answer it, uh, but it says Neelay's examples about disconnected data are great. I can see how a hospital system can easily connect to that data but how might a test or device maker whose products are used across a state or the country tackle connecting all this data? And let's assume it's not all within system. I know Mayo, Mayo is, has a lot of, of different sites, but let's assume it's, you don't have a system that's countrywide. Any insights beyond single site real world data collection? Can anybody pop in with some suggestions here? of my yeah. panelists. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Um, yeah. you know, the, the example that I mentioned, I think has been um, really helpful. We actually partnered with the industry partner as well as FDA to do a proof of concept um, uh, project for patients to be able to link their own data and then share it with investigators. Uh, so in this context, this was a platform called Hugo Health that we had used. And that platform allows the patients to be able to get all their own data and then share it with whoever they want. Um, for um, you know, uh, used, having used various different types of data sources, um, we found this to be a really valuable approach to connect a lot of the different data sources or different places patients' data may reside. And, and I think the actual other strength is the patient is at the center of this. So the patient can, um, you know, sort of knows how their data are being used, can be engaged. So in the context of the project we did, we actually asked patients to uh, provide patient reported outcomes. And this was in the context of bariatric surgery and um, ablation for atrial fibrillation. The patients could, uh, you know, provide patient reported outcomes. But it also connects to, uh, it was able to also uh, get data from devices, so from Fitbits and uh, Bluetooth weight scales and single lead EKGs. Those were also pulled into um, this approach. So we found that to be a great approach where really um, you don't have to be in a single health system or anywhere else. You can, as long as you engage patients in the process, um, it's a really great approach to be able to link a variety of different data sources together um, uh -huh. to generate evidence. Great, great idea. Any other thoughts from our panelists? Ed, Sue, Wendy, would you, any of you like to weigh in on that question? Yeah, uh, Danielle, this is, this is Ed. Uh, Hi, I, Ed. We would. Um, and so, you know, as I look at that question and, you know, uh, uh, you know, it kind of emphasizes being a test or device maker whose products are, you know, are used, you know, uh, uh, across the, uh, the states or, or, or uh, countries, et cetera. And really, that's where a lot of the work that we've done with SHIELD and even partnering with uh, organizations such as I IICC that co you know, comes in because you know, a significant amount of work has, been, uh, has taken place on establishing uh, connectivity protocols for uh, you know, IVD devices. Uh, so that you know, uh, it's, it's called LAW or the Laboratory Analytical Workflow. It, it's a standard now that's, uh, that has been um, uh, published as, uh, through IHE uh, as part of their, their profiles, as well as CLSI as Auto 16. So it is a standard that IBD devices can follow 
in order to transmit information uh, you know, from their system to other laboratory systems such as the LIS. And it, it captures a lot of these uh, concepts we've talked about today as far as device identification, for example, and you know, test identification and et cetera. And then in addition to that, that's where the LIVET specification also comes into play because for information as a device maker that you're unable to transmit through the, through the interface, you can also provide a uh, industry standard uh, catalog or document uh, based on our, our LIVET specification that provides the additional information uh, that's needed you know, to, to basically take that uh, result that the device has, has uh, uh, transmitted or, or provided and turn it into real world data. So, so there are definitely some, some important you know, uh, uh, tools and, and um, uh, really protocols and resources available you know, to, to help device manufacturers. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah, Anybody want to weigh in there? Else? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, th this is great because um, I actually have like on, on my list of, of questions to be tackling as we're moving through the project. That was one of them. You know, you, we talked about um, setting up our intended use and in, in identifying what um, data fields we need, but then it's sort of the feasibility of what you want to do. So we know our data fields and we set up our potential study and what we want to do, but it's really then you have to look at the feasibility of that and the types of data and availability of the data. And one of the questions I had on mine was how do you access from multiple sources? So that's, that's great to hear Ed and Neelay give um, you know, some suggestions there that I think will be really helpful. Yeah, a couple of questions to follow up. Wendy, go ahead, please, and then I'll get back to these couple of questions. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say it's very timely, uh, but FDA just released a few days ago uh, draft guidance on uh, patient reported outcomes for device manufacturers. And uh, so I think anybody interested in this part of the conversation would do well to um, take a look at that. And um, it's open for comment until uh, October. So um, uh, it's very topical. Awesome. Thank you very much, Wendy. And that is an important new um, draft guidance that's out. Um, a couple of questions that popped up from this conversation, and I love when this conversation gets going and I can't keep up with the questions. It's awesome. Um, first of all, a question that came up, and it, it's almost more of a comment, but I think it, it, these, these two sort of link together too. In the example of Hugo Health that you gave, Neele, which was the patient-owned uh, platform to share data, how do you be preserve the actual real-world setting if possibly these participants may be self-selecting because they're more tech-savvy? Um, th I, there's always the chance, for example, you might miss enrolling patients who are elderly or just don't consider themselves um, tech savvy or don't have access to technology at all. Anybody yeah, want to no, take that? Yep, yeah, ahead, no, I'll, I'll just quickly <laughs> answer that based on our experience. So okay. um, there's a, a project where we focus specifically on low income populations and their ability to uh, participate. And I think found very high levels of uptake and actually almost um, greater engagement through this process. Um, and then, um, you know, sometimes there is a startup cost to this a little bit. Uh, for the projects, we actually had um, study coordinators sort of work with patients to just get them set up initially. So it was time to get them set up and get connected initially. Once they were connected, it was relatively um, seamless, uh, but there was an initial cost. And there, you know, there is some variation based on age, based on, um, you know, tech literacy and so forth. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's it's an opportunity, I think, as we go forward, especially to engage patients in this type of work and getting more um, meaningful outcomes while completely acknowledging that, that there are challenges. There may be populations that may be less likely to participate and so forth, um, and, and we just have to be cognizant and try to see how we can remove those barriers and enable more people to participate in, in those type of approaches. Terrific. Um, thank you. There's another question that's popped up from our participants, um, and that's, is informed consent always required for real-world evidence studies? And since the EHR is protected by HIPAA, is privacy um, or the concern for privacy also a hurdle for real-world evidence? Um, Wendy, would you like to take that one? So I think I'll just say it that a, at a high level, um, the privacy uh, concerns need to be addressed, and that is talk, that is spoken about in the framework. Um, I think I'm 
maybe going to answer this more on the just the, the, the stricter level of uh, you know what, what do you do when you are collecting EHR data? Um, you know, one one approach is that the the entities doing the collection um, seek a IRB approval um, for their project uh, as a kind of a blanket um, and to make sure that there's an outside entity looking at what's being done. Um, also, uh, this also comes down to um, practical matters about how to de-identify the information. Um, and so there are two general approaches. One is to remove all, um, uh, I think uh, PII, I think is a personally identifying information. And actually, when we're talking about um, uh, conditions that may be rare, ages or outcomes or um, locations, it's not that hard to triangulate on who an individual is, um, even if uh, PII is, is removed. So another approach is statistical de-identification, um, which takes into account uh, likelihoods of being able to identify somebody um, uh, within a data set um, and also takes into account uh, who will be handling the information and might have perhaps some motive to um, uh, de-identify it. Um, so it's a serious question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you so much. And I know that the framework does talk a little bit about informed consent, but uh, that is definitely um, an issue that needs to be considered depending on what the, what the study is. Um, question that we received a little bit earlier, how can one leverage an RWD in augmenting a prospectively planned IVD study? Um, and then it has the question, does the framework discuss any case examples and methods for use of RWD? I'll answer this last one with a simple yes, the framework does discuss case examples and some methods for use of real world data. Uh, but the first question I'd like to toss to uh, my, my colleagues on the panel, how can one leverage real world data in augmenting a prospectively planned IVD study? Who'd like to take this one first? Wendy, can I ask you to weigh in? Yes, um, and so the, I think the, the question speaks to um, the notion that um, uh, all, you know already collected data and doing retrospective analysis of already collected data is the usual approach here. Um, in a prospective data collection, um, there there is actually some opportunity to have an intervention. Um, although in, you know, such as collecting a second sample uh, for comparison purposes. But it, that again also raises issues of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, if, you're, if you're changing anything out of the routine, um, it's, it may, you know, um, it's like, you know, sh looking at Schrodinger's cat, you're actually changing um, the situation by simply observing it. Okay. Um, uh, one of the things I'd, I'd like to toss out now is I have this great group of panelists. Would you like to ask each other a question? Do you have a question you'd like to ask any of you? If not, you're going to get asked a question. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. No question. Yeah, oh, you know, Danelle, well, I think you asked mine, uh, you know, before, and, and uh, but I, I think it, it deserves another sort of pick at it, maybe to Neil. Sure. What do you think, like, the most difficult um, piece of this is going to be? You know, when, when Wendy was talking about this, you know, the thing that, that stuck in my mind was the, um, you, you said something about, you know, the speed of, of this program as well, and, and how fast we're going. And obviously, because, you um, you know, we're, we're under an EUA because we're in a, a public health um, emergency right now that, that could go away. So we want to make sure that we've got our products properly marketed with 510Ks um, so we're able to, to continue using them. So when we're, you know, we are on sort of this fast path to try to get to where we need to. So Neely, do you have, you know, one specific thing that you think is going to be the most challenging? Because 
looking at it from, from the manufacturer side, you know, if you're just looking at, okay, here's the data we need, this seems like it should be really simple to just go out and get it because this is what, you know, we're spelling it out and this is what we want. We all know it's not that easy, but what, what do you think is going to be the, the most difficult um, sort of, of hurdle to, to cross? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll say I think the first one is, I think we're getting closer to it, is one, if we're interested in the test from a specific manufacturer. So can um, we get from electronic health record being able to identify which specific platform the test was conducted on? And that's not always as <laughs> yeah. as easy as it might seem. And so, so I think that's uh, how do we get the systems uh, to be able to have that data incorporated more routinely as part of the, um, you know, their electronic systems. And I think that the second issue, and this I think broadly applies not just to this specific context, is how do we, um, I you know, have confidence in the endpoints. So what's the real world endpoints and how do we have confidence in those endpoints, right? So if they are um, endpoints based on diagnostic codes, are we um, confident that those are the, uh, uh, when those are recorded, that they are the true endpoints and we are comfortable with those endpoints, right? So in typically in clinical trials, we have, um, you know, the, the endpoints are reviewed by, uh, you know, uh, by investigators or uh, uh, coordinators and, and validated uh, when we're using existing endpoints, are they uh, good enough and how do we ensure or create uh, enough algorithms to, in, uh, to be comfortable with those endpoints that are used for any, um, you know, regulatory purposes. I think that will be, in my mind, one of the key hurdles um, from a regulatory perspective is, is to make sure that we have enough confidence in the endpoints we are able to um, collect from existing data. Thank you. Great. Any other questions from the panel? If not, I've got one last question I want to ask each of you. Can I, you know, I had um, one quick question. This may be for- Sure, please. Wendy and for Ed maybe, is, you know, as the SHIELD framework was sort of developed, how was it harmonized with other, or, you know, what was the thought process about harmonizing with other common data models that exist that are based on electronic health record data? So for example, you could pick OMOP or PCORnet or Sentinel, you know, that that's used by the FDA. It is, is there a thought process right now? It's like Shield sort of is a standalone and it'd be um, ideal, especially from a health system perspective as a number of these different um, data models sort of pop up is how do we sort of synergize them to come to some um, single standard? I don't know if there was some um, thought process in the context of Shield in there. Yeah, so Danielle, uh, this is it. I, I, I can jump in for a, a new Please. first. That'd be great. Yes, yeah, so, so Neely, um, there, there's certainly been some, you know, some discussions around, you know, what models are out there, uh, you know, what, what are people doing today as they collect data and, and uh, organize it and structure it. And, and so part of what we've tried to do within a Shield is to, is to understand what some of those core elements are. So, you know, one important one that, that you, you've highlighted is just the device identification. You know, how do I establish the equipment that this test was, was ran on and, and, you know, where can that be captured, collected, transmitted? And, and so I, I think our focus has been a little bit more on these core elements that we know somewhat independent of a, of a data model that are going to be required and looking at the challenges of making sure that gets, that gets captured at the appropriate time in an appropriate manner that allows it to be easily transported to one of these other systems. Uh, you know, I, I think as you get into maybe some of the diversity of, you know, particular models being used for, um, you know, maybe uh, particular uh, situations or analysis, you know, I, you're certainly going to run into, into some differences on the data. But, you know, really that, that core data that you need, I think what, we, what we've, really what we've learned doesn't change. There's this core set of information, and, and that's really been our focus is to make sure those elements are covered uh, so that, you know, across the broad spectrum of, of these different models, we're providing, you know, th this consistent information that they all need. Great. And anybody else want to add to that? No? Okay. 
Well, I have one last question for the panelists. I want you each to take about 30 seconds um, and give me what one thing do you think needs to happen to make real world evidence an acceptable norm in terms of evidence for regulatory decision making? And that's recognizing it's already in use, but how do we get it to be used more frequently? Yeah, so I, I can go first on that one. I think from, from my perspective, it, it's the ease of use. So it, it has been used, it can be used, but I think the ease of use and when you're looking um, to how to, to put, you know, if you're looking at doing a clinical study or going out to gather real world evidence, that the real world evidence path is, is an easier path than going the clinical study path. So I think once we get it to a point where um, it's more well understood on, on how to get through the process, um, and it becomes easier, I think it'll be more, well, it'd be more used. By folks. Terrific. Thank you, Sue. Who wants to go next? Hi, Danielle. Uh, Danielle, this is Ed. So Thanks, uh, Ed. I think my, my uh, um, kind of requirement is it's really getting that, that proper support and buy-in from the, the device manufacturers, you know, the, uh, uh, the vendors of the systems, uh, you know, whether it's LISs, EHR, et cetera, around the collection of the data that's really needed for, for, for real world evidence and, and real world data. Great. Because there, you know, there's systems that you know, today don't collect the things that, that are, are the, the elements that, that are needed. And so it's really, I think, the industry working together to establish, hey, you know, this information as it comes off the instrument and makes its way you know, into an LIS, into an EHR, reported to public health, you've got to have this information and in this format. Terrific, thank you. Wendy and Neelay. Um, Wendy? Can... Neelay? Okay, go ahead, Neelay. <laughs> we'll go. save uh, Wendy for last. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I think the, the area where um, it, that would be really helpful is trying to better understand where, what type of evidence can be generated with high enough quality with real world evidence or real world Good data point. specifically. Good and point. so, uh, and then what type of um, regulatory decisions like label extensions versus uh, a new, um, uh, you know, approval may be different contexts. So I think we need to better validate how well can we generate high quality evidence for, uh, from real world data and in what context. I think um, those are going to be key areas that we need to gen, you know, have a better understanding from before we start using um, our WE uh, more routinely. Great. Wendy, any last thought? Yeah, it's hard to go last because uh, <laughs> great ideas are taken, um, but uh, I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, standardization, it's just such a boring word, <laughs> um, but, but I, I always keep coming back to it. Um, and if we, if we had standardization, we would have more complete data uh, because the data wouldn't be falling, falling out because we simply can't make sense of it. Um, and it, would, it, it solves a number of problems all by itself. Um, but the, there are barriers to attaining standardization because uh, uh, you, you, know, you, you have to invest energy into it. And from a stakeholder standpoint, there, there needs to be a, a reason really to, um, to make a connection between the LIS and the EHR and to look at longitudinal outcomes. Um, so I think that that's what's, what I think is so great about, uh, you know, well, um, this work group where we're trying to uh, look at the feasibility of of using existing RWD to, um, you know, turn an EUA into a 510K. Um, it's a very practical use. So many people are so engaged in this happening that it's providing the kind of activation energy that we need to, to solve these um, system-wide problems. And the, the great thing is that if we, if we solve it for, uh, for, for COVID, because COVID is so important, it will be um, that much more straightforward to do it for all the other disorders that we're, that we're also concerned about. 
Well, thank you. And with that, thank you to all of the incredible panelists. You've been absolutely wonderful. This has been a great, robust conversation, as well as to the engaged participants for the questions that you asked that challenged all of us to really think. Thank you for attending MDIC's annual public forum. We hope you will join us for next week's session, where we will discuss patient preferences for heart failure devices, a collaborative study. Visit apf.mdic.org for more information and to catch up on previous sessions.